Hello, and welcome to The Daily Space. My name is Dr. Pamela Gay, and most weekdays, the CosmoQuest team is here putting science in your brain. Today, today, however, is for rocket roundups. Let's get to it, shall we? After months of not launching any rockets, India finally sent one up, and Gordon jinxed it. On August 12th at 0013 UTC, an Indian GSLV Mark II launched from the second launch pad at the Satesh Dhaven Space Center in southern India. On board was the EOS-3 satellite. Let's watch that launch. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one, zero. Plus five seconds. Lift off normal. Majestic lift off and, and a very good launch of the GSLV F10. Initially, the launch looked normal through both the first and second stage burn. Then the third stage separated and appeared to ignite, but seconds afterward, the live animation began a slow roll and end-to-end -end pitch. The on-screen graph of anticipated trajectory versus actual trajectory diverged, with the actual trajectory bending down back towards Earth. ISRO signed off the webcast, stating the outcome of the mission will be determined soon. Soon after the webcast was over, a website update in tweet stated that the third stage ignition did not take place at all due to a technical anomaly. The satellite on board the failed launch was the EOS-3, also called the GISAT-1. As an Earth-observing satellite operating in geostationary orbit, it was intended to provide 50-meter resolu resolution multispectral images of the entire Indian subcontinent every 30 minutes. This launch was planned for earlier in 2021, but it was significantly delayed due to the impact of the novel coronavirus pandemic on India. In order to provide hospitals with oxygen, the ISRO propellant factory pivoted to producing oxygen for patients instead of rockets. ISRO engineers also came up with three different ventilator designs to meet the overwhelming demand by the pandemic. Next up, a small rocket that launched a powerful satellite. On August 17th at 0147 UTC, an Arion Space Vega rocket launched the Pleiades NEO-4 imaging satellite and four CubeSats into a sun-synchronous orbit from the Guiana Space Center in Kourou, French Guiana. Let's take a look at that launch. Pleiades NEO-4 is the second satellite in a new constellation of commercial high-resolution imaging spacecraft. It is designed and operated by Airbus Defense in space and capable of 30-centimeter ground resolution from its 700-kilometer orbit. That's enough to resolve something the size of a demi-baguette. Currently, Vega can only lift a single 920-kilogram Pleiades NEO satellite, which is the equivalent of 462 liter soda bottles into orbit. Starting next year, the upcoming new and improved Vega C rocket will be able to launch the remaining two of the NEO satellites. Although the main payload was huge, Ariane Space was able to lift an additional four tiny satellites on board, one commercial and three other scientific satellites sponsored by the European Space Agency. These included RadCube. It's a three-unit CubeSat designed to provide real-time monitoring of cosmic radiation and other space weather measurements. Data will be released to the public and industry. Also included was LEDSAT, a one-unit CubeSat, and it was a collaboration between universities in the U.S. and Italy and sponsored by the European Space Agency. 
It will act as a target to test systems for orbit determination, which is the term for finding out exactly what orbit an object is in around the planet. For a satellite to be observed in low Earth orbit, it must be in sunlight while the telescope doing the observations is in darkness. The LED SAT solves this problem by providing its own light using a combination of LEDs and retroreflectors, which are special mirrors that reflect light exactly back towards its emitter. And they will also serve as a backup communication system using flashing lights. The third CubeSat is Brez Reconnaissance Orbiter 4. The six-unit CubeSat has a payload built by the Unseen Labs and has a Commercial Signals Intelligent mission. The final CubeSat on the mission is a two-unit spacecraft called Sunstorm, a European Space Agency mission that carries an X-ray spectrometer to study coronal mass ejections, which are the source of damaging solar storms on Earth. And that was all that went up with this amazing rocket. And after the break, we're going to be back to talk about the rocket that still hasn't flown. These will be the continuing adventures of Starliner's OFT-2 mission. Stay tuned. In case you missed it, Boeing's Starliner has been having a lot of issues. 20 months after its near disaster of a first test flight, the spacecraft was finally ready for another attempt, but it keeps running into issues that cause further delays. The latest delay is due to a series of 13 stuck valves that control the flow of oxidizer, in this case nitrogen tetraoxide, from the vehicle's propellant tanks to the reaction control system thrusters that orient it in space. The Starliner has 64 valves in its reaction control system, 24 for the oxidizer nitrogen tetraoxide, 24 for the fuel unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine, and 16 valves for the helium gas that is used to pressurize both the propellant and the oxidizer. There are separate sets of nitrogen tetraoxide and unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine valves for the much larger launch escape engines. Only the oxidizer valves in the reaction control system seem to be affected. Boeing attempted to free the valves while the spacecraft was still stacked atop its Atlas V rocket at the launch facility and was able to free most of them, but as of last week, four remain stuck. Boeing used electrical and thermal techniques to open the valves. The company made an announcement at a press conference on August 13th that they would unstack the Starliner from its rocket and take it for further troubleshooting at its factory on Kennedy Space Center grounds. In order to access the remaining stuck valves, the capsule will be separated from its service module. Boeing thinks the root cause of the valve sticking is atmospheric moisture mixing with oxidizer that leaked through a seal in the valves. When moisture mixes with nitrogen tetroxide, it creates nitric acid, which is what corroded the valves and stopped them from responding to commands. Even if the valve issue is resolved quickly, there are a lot of factors which could delay Starliner's next opportunity for a second orbital test flight. The most significant factor is NASA's upcoming Lucy mission. Like OFT2, Lucy needs Slick 41, the East Coast Atlas V pad, for its 24-day launch window out to, a tro out to the Trojan asteroids. And that launch window opens on October 16th. If Lucy misses this window, it will have to wait until next year to launch. And if that doesn't happen, the next opportunity is another two years later in 2024. So Lucy gets the pad for as long as it needs this fall, and everyone else has to wait. United Launch Alliance needs 17 days on either side of a launch period to switch between missions, according to CEO Tori Bruno, which pushes the earliest the OFT-2 can launch to the end of October even if Lucy launches on the first day of its launch window. 
ULA will potentially reduce this time by using the Atlas V first stage originally stacked for OFT2 for the Lucy mission. The second stage for the OFT2 cannot be used for Lucy as it is a special configuration for Starliner. Meanwhile, the International Space Station that is Starliner's destination has a packed schedule of visiting vehicles that also restricts when it can launch. CRS-23, the next Cargo Dragon mission to the ISS, is scheduled to launch at the end of August. CRS-23 will spend a month at the station occupying one of the two IDA ports for the Star that the Starliner needs. The other port is occupied by SpaceX Crew-2, currently set to return in November. SpaceX Crew-3 will launch after CRS-23 in late October, providing for a direct handover before Crew-2 departs. Operational crew missions take priority over an uncrewed test flight, which will delay OFT-2 to December, or even earlier, 2022. Hopefully this will give Boeing the time they need to fix all the issues with the OFT-2 spacecraft. And that's all we know. And I think that's enough. And after the break, we examine the difficulties in getting to the outer planets in this week in rocket history. This week in rocket history, the launch of Voyager 2. The problem with space is that it's big, like really big. It takes light almost an hour to get to Earth from Jupiter, and that's the closest of the outer planets. In terms of space missions, this means that visiting the outer planets either requires very long transit times or very large launch vehicles. Long transits could mean decades, likely resulting in the original science team retiring before the spacecraft arrives. Large launch vehicles are risky and have a high price tag, severely limiting how many missions we could afford to launch. What we needed was a game changer, something that would let us use smaller rockets and still get there quickly. That game changer was the gravitational assist. In the early years of the space race, mathematicians set to work coming up with a method to get to the outer planets more rapidly. The first breakthrough was in 1961, when then-graduate student Michael Mananovich presented a paper describing a gravity assist. Here's how he did it. His first task was to calculate a change in orbit when a spacecraft encountered a planet, the so-called two-body problem. This method is similar to how the game Kerbal Space Program calculates orbits. After arriving at a solution, he tried a much more difficult task, the three-body problem. The three-body problem calculates a two-body encounter in the context of both bodies starting in orbit of the sun. This is a much harder calculation, but the result was spectacular. Menovich demonstrated how a spacecraft could change its orbit using the encounter. This can be used to effectively fling the spacecraft into a higher orbit by stealing a tiny amount of the planet's rotation. Menovich's work gained prominence when a scientist named Max Hunter used gravity assists to design a grand tour mission to the outer planets in 1964. The proposed mission only required 5 kilograms of propellant rather than the 145 metric tons required without using gravity assists. In 1965, Gary Flandro, a NASA engineer, identified a once-in-176-year opportunity to visit all four outer planets in a single mission, an opportunity that would happen 12 years later in 1977. The gravity assist concept was demonstrated on the Pioneer 11 mission, which used it to do a massive handbrake turn in space to go from Jupiter to Saturn when the mission was only planned to go to Jupiter. Initially, the Voyager program was only funded to visit Jupiter and Saturn and was called Mariner Jupiter Saturn. But JPL was sneaky and designed a spacecraft to last long enough to do the full grand tour. The next thing to determine was which trajectories to use. 
NASA engineers looked at 10,000 different trajectories. Very important to the science goal of the mission was a close encounter with Saturn's moon Titan. Titan was the only moon known to have an atmosphere at the time. Flying by Titan, however, would prevent the spacecraft from visiting Uranus and Neptune because the trajectory to get close to Titan would send it out of the ecliptic, the plane in which all of the planets orbit the Sun. One spacecraft would go to Jupiter, Saturn, and Titan, and out of the ecliptic. The other would go to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. If the first spacecraft failed to get to Titan, the other would go to Titan and forgo the rest of the grand tour. One major engineering consideration for spacecraft design involved the distance they would travel. They couldn't use solar panels billions of kilometers from the sun, so they would need nuclear generators known as radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTGs. These produce tiny amounts of electricity from radioactive decay over long periods of time. The heat is turned into electricity with a series of devices known as thermocouples, which generate electricity based on their temperature. That's the trajectory in the spacecraft itself sorted. But what about the science? NASA put out a formal request for proposals in April 1972 in the following investigation areas imaging, radio science, infrared and ultraviolet spectroscopy, magnometry, charged particles, cosmic rays, photopolarimetry, planetary radio astronomy, plasma, and particulate matter. They received over 200 responses from which 90 scientists were invited. These scientists were further organized into 12 teams, each in charge of a different instrument. You can read more about the different instruments in the Patreon bonus content for this week's episode. The instruments for the two spacecraft were chosen years in advance, based on initial observations by Pioneer 10 and 11 at Jupiter and Saturn. For example, a planned ultraviolet pol polarimeter for Voyager was removed in favor of a plasma experiment after Pioneer 10 revealed a thousand times more intense radiation environment around Jupiter than expected. One of the more famous things on Voyager 2 wasn't an instrument and didn't have a principal investigator. The Sounds of Earth record, more commonly called the Voyager Golden Record. Created by a committee led by Carl Sagan, it was included on the off chance an intelligent species encounters the spacecraft millennia in the future. It would tell them something about humanity. It was a 32-centimeter wide, gold-plated copper disc that had two hours of content recorded onto it, including nature sounds, music, and greetings in 60 languages. On the outside of the disk were diagrams depicting human beings and different fundamental concepts in math and science, and instructions on how to play it. In 40,000 years, Voyager 2 will pass within two light years of the star Ross 248 in the constellation Andromeda. Voyager 2 was launched first on August 20th, 1977, to go on the full grand tour trajectory. Its Titan 3E rocket's maximum performance was barely able to put it on the planned trajectory to eventually meet up with Uranus. To find out what happened with the rest of the mission and with Voyager 1, stay tuned to Rocket Roundup for future episodes of This Week in Rocket History. After the break, we'll be back with our weekly statistics and a random space fact. Stay tuned. To wrap things up, here's a running tally of a few spaceflight statistics for the current year. Toilets currently in space, eight. Four installed on the International Space Station, one on the Crew Dragon, one on the Soyuz, one on the Shenzhou, and one on the Tianhe. Total 2021 orbital launch attempts, 78, including five failures. Total satellites from launches, 1,316. We keep track of orbital launches by where they launched from, also known as spaceport. Here's that breakdown. 
USA, 28. China, 28. Kazakhstan, 6. Russia, 6. New Zealand, 4. French Guiana, 3. India, 2. Iran, 1. Your random space fact for this week is that NASA hired surfers in Southern California to install the installation on the common bulkhead of the Saturn V second stage because the insulation was similar to the material the surfers made their surfboards out of. This has been The Daily Space.